Okay, now let's talk about lung expansion therapy. How do we increase the volume going to the lungs? In order to increase the volume, we need to increase the transpulmonary pressure gradient. And how do we do that? The first way is to decrease pleural pressure. That's denoted in this first small drawing of the alveolus. We decrease pleural pressure when we take a deep breath. We drop our diaphragm by pushing our belly out and we create a more negative pressure in the pleural space. That causes a pressure gradient that lets air flow into the collapsed alveoli. The other method is to increase alveolar pressure which is denoted in this second drawing on this slide. This is done by applying positive pressure which we'll talk about later. To minimize the need for lung expansion therapy we're going to encourage our patients to deep breathe shortly after any surgery. We also encourage early ambulation, meaning we get patients up and walk, in, walk them around a little bit and they naturally take some deep breaths. Another method to reduce the need for lung expansion therapy is frequent repositioning. So incentive spirometry, referred to as IS, IS is the device that's used to encourage deep breathing. The type of breath that we're going to coach our patients to do is a long, slow, deep breath, also referred to as a sustained maximal inspiration, or an SMI. This is a breath to total lung capacity, ideally, meaning as big and deep a breath as we can possibly get, because our goals are to increase that transpulmonary pressure and increase the inspiratory volumes. We want to improve inspiratory muscle performance and reestablish pulmonary high for inflation or pulmonary inflation. Incentive spirometry works for cooperative patients who can actually take a deep breath. There are several different devices. This is the most common one we see used currently in hospitals. It's a volume oriented flow sensitive device, meaning we need to coach the patient for proper flow rates, so these type of devices are going to have some sort of flow indicator because again we want a slow flow. We don't want so so slow that they're never going to get the breath up but we don't want a quick deep breath in because if they take a quick deep breath in the, primar the majority of the air is going to go to the apices or the areas that are non-analectic. Where if we can get a nice slow flow rate we're going to be able to expand some of those to those deeper regions of the lung. We're also going to look for a goal to encourage the patients to get to. So inside of these device, inside each new incentive spirometer, there'll be a predicted volume estimation that's based on the patient's sex, height, and age. And we look at that to determine the predicted volume that we're going to coach our patients to do. There's also a um, flow sensitive device that is not as accurate but they are smaller and more reasonable so some facilities may still use these. This is this provides an approximate volume that's based on have, encouraging the patient to suck this ball to the top of the chamber as they're breathing in. There are several different flow settings and what we do is we take the amount of time they were able to keep the ball at the top of this column times it by the flow rate that's been set and we can have an estimated volume. Because what we're really looking at is were they able to get a larger volume after performing this? So how does the performance work? Well we want to know our equipment first. The biggest thing is we do is we have them um, seal their lips around the mouthpiece that comes in the incentive spirometer. We ask them to inspire slow and deep, coaching them to the volume that's been predicted, and coaching them to the proper approximate flow rate. We ask them to do diaphragmatic breathing, meaning they're going to push their stomach out to get their stomach contents out of the way so there's more room for the diaphragm to drop. So oftentimes if you take a deep breath in, try this now, take a deep breath in. A lot of times when we deep breathe we actually raise our shoulders to get a deeper breath. Well that's actually not as effective is if we diaphragmatic breathe, meaning we're going to push our stomachs out. Push your stomach out 
as you're deep breathing. And this can be especially hard for women because we like to walk around with our stomachs sucked in. So push your stomach out. That allows for your diaphragm to drop lower and get a breath, bigger breath in. We encourage a three to five second breath hold. The breath hold is a period where there's no flow and it allows for the pressure within the lungs to equilibrate. By allowing this time during the breath hold, this is where we may be able to open up some of those collapsed alveoli because we're allowing for that pressure to equalize across different sections of the lung. We ask, ask the patient to exhale normally and then rest between breaths if they become tired. The clinical practice guideline talks about doing six breaths per hour. However, most hospitals have the patient take 10 breaths. So indications in the clinical practice guideline. So I would like you to go to the AARC website and look at their resources section for the clinical practice guidelines and find the CPG for incentive spirometry. The main thing we're going to look at in these clinical practice guidelines are indications, contraindications, hazards. So indications are, first of all, a predisposing situation such as upper abdominal surgery, thoracic surgery, or patients with COPD that also have gone through surgery. The second one is the presence of atelectasis, generally documented from the x-ray. Um, the third one is the presence of a restrictive lung deficit, such as those patients associated with quadriplegia or a dysfunctional diaphragm. Contraindications are those patients that cannot be instructed on appropriate use. They're, they are not able to cooperate or not able to understand your instructions. They're unable to deep breathe enough. How do we define deep breath? There's two different ways that we're going to see this. One is taking 10 to 15 milliliters per kilogram of their ideal body weight or about one-third or 30 percent of predicted. The predicted value again is from a chart that comes with each new incentive spirometer that's based on their sex, height, and age. And if their actual volume is less than one-third of that predicted volume, we're going to say that's not a deep enough breath. If the patient has an open stoma, there, there is an adapter to make the incentive spirometer work. There are several hazards to incentive spirometry. Sometimes incentive spirometry can be ineffective if there's no super supervision when the patient's doing this on their own. If there's quite a bit of atelectasis or alveolar collapse, this may not be enough treatment on its own. Because we're having the patient take deep breaths in, a, in sometimes a short amount of time, it can lead to some hyperventilation where they've blown off too much CO2 and patients may feel a little tingly in their toes or their fingers or complain of being lightheaded. Because we're asking for higher volumes, it can cause barotrauma in those patients with COPD, sometimes referred to as volutrauma. There can be some discomfort associated with this where the patient complains of pain. If the pain is due to m movement of the incision site around the surgery, one way to overcome this is to splint that area. A splint really is where we place a blanket or a pillow over the incision site and ask the patient to apply pressure or will apply pressure to that site. By holding the surgical site in place while they're deep breathing, sometimes that can minimize the pain. The patients can become hypoxic if O2 is interrupted. If you think about it, we're asking the patient to seal their lips around the mouthpiece of the incentive spirometer and breathe through their mouth only. If they've been wearing a nasal cannula during this, they're going to have a reduction in the FiO2 that they're receiving during the treatments. Depending on the flow rate that the patient's on, you may want to um, do continual pulse oximetry throughout the incentive spirometry treatment 
or have them take frequent breaks between maybe every two or three breaths. This can cause some bronchoconstriction in some patients from bronchospasm due to the high air flows that are generated or higher air flows generated during sinuspirometry. Incentive Again, remember, we're not asking the patient to breathe really fast. We're asking them to do a slow, deep breath in, but oftentimes, instinctually, they're trying to get a deep breath in, and they breathe faster than we would like them. Incentive spirometry can also lead to some fatigue. This is the end of the Section 2 for incentive spirometry.